Hi, welcome to the Art for All podcast. I'm Danny Gregory. I'm the founder of Sketchbook School. And each week on this podcast, I get either a friend or somebody who I'd like to have as my friend. And we sit down and have a, a good, deep conversation about something to do with art, creativity, being an artist. Um, oh, there's so many issues around being a creative person. And I love to talk about it. And I love to find people who are also thinking about it and um, confronting the issues that we all seem to face. Um, this week, I'm bringing on my friend Ann Lemon. I've known Ann for a couple of decades, probably. She and my wife, we've been, our, we've been family friends back and forth for a long time. We've worked together, and she's just a really smart, hilarious person. And Ann has undergone um, a severe trauma, which is the loss of her son, um, the summer he was to go to college. And he was an incredible kid. Um, and the story around what happened to him and what's happened since is, I imagine, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and is, uh, as I said, a, a very creative person. She was an advertising art director. Then she was a, a teacher at Cuts Down University, where she taught graphic design. And now she has really devoted her life and her husband's time and life, too, to running a foundation um, devoted to the work of Amos Burkhart Lemon, who's her, her late son. And she's going to really get, go deep, I imagine, to this story. And we're going to talk about, about the foundation, about what she's hoping to accomplish with it, and about the incredibly important and moving message that Amos's work has left us with. So I think this is going to be a powerful episode, powerful conversation, and I'm going to give you some information in the notes for this uh, interview or chat um, so you can find out more about the foundation and about uh, Amos himself who's a really inspiring character. Um, I'll put that in the notes here for the podcast and on YouTube. Let's, let's chat with Anne. Last time we talked, you were still um, a professor. Right. I am no longer professing to be a professor. Yeah. So I, um, it got to the point last fall, like a year ago, where... It felt like this foundation nonprofit that we started building was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and busier and busier and busier. And um, teaching was changing a lot, uh, which is fine. I love change and I love learning new things and adapting. And I kind of enjoyed the COVID experience of teaching because I rewrote a whole bunch of curriculums and started delivering things by you know, video. I actually took a lot of inspiration from Danny Gregory, but um, it just felt really unmanageable because I was doing three jobs at once. So I decided to retire from teaching and devote myself to this nonprofit full time. And um, in the process, we just sold this house that I am actually sitting in last wow, really? Saturday. Uh, we just <sighs> received an offer on it. And we're getting ready to move into a fantastic new space that is going to be offices downstairs and then our residence upstairs um, in January. So we have a few months left before we have to do that. That's incredible. And, Congratulations. Uh, That's really good. Thank you. So, um, so yeah, and it's the, the minute that I did that, it, things kind of even more went to another level with our nonprofit and um, the Amos Lemon Burkhart Foundation. And I am currently sitting in, this is my art storage room. Each one of those is a piece of Amos's work that is in a fantastic, my hair is super cray cray right now, but that's okay. Nobody cares. Um, each one of these is a custom made envelope. <clears throat> For those of you who are listening to this, because it is a podcast, uh, so long. Um, she's pulling uh, down bubble wrapped things from a shelf. 
Yes. These were, we looked all over the world to try to find an efficient art storage system to be able to travel with artwork that's very valuable and precious and easily install it and deinstall it from galleries and museums. And we could not find anyone that like made, or, you know, we looked at crates, we looked at boxes, we looked at envelopes, and we could not find anything where it was clear that somebody had to custom make each thing individually, no matter what kind of system you're using. So we ended up buying a very simple um, bubble wrap ceiling thing and then creating a bubble wrap envelope that has a little flap for each item so that we can put the inventory sticker on the outside of it and it exactly fits the artwork so that every time we go to install or uninstall in a gallery we don't have to like fumble around with a million kinds of used random bubble wrap and tape it all up and then untape it all and then put it all back and try to check against the inventory list. Do we have this one? Do we have that one? What size is this one? Which box does that one go in? How do we load them in the van? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, Because we have a bunch of shows lined up and we seem to be doing things, especially in the upcoming um, couple months where we're like uninstalling one day and then installing someplace else the next day. And so having an efficient system is really going to help. But Anyway, that's just one little detail in the kind of things that we, like, I didn't expect to have to think through as we kind of loaded up our schedule with events to do. And um, it's an example of how I think when you set out to be an artist or um, are in the business of art making somehow, and it's a business, you just have no idea the number of tasks, it's not very clearly explained. There's not like a learning manual for how to be an artist or run an arts organization, really, even though there's a lot of classes online, there's a lot of things that you can learn, but it's a constant process of creative problem solving. Um, There's not one way, you know, I guess if you're an accountant, there was probably not one way either. Not really sure. But I think if, I think if you're an accountant, they teach you how to, They teach you how to be an accountant and how to run an accounting business. Whereas, yeah, in art school, they don't teach you that stuff at all. Yeah, it's a lesson I try to impart to um, interns. I have a bunch of college and high school interns right now, and I just got to meet my new crop of high school interns. I'm so excited about them. They're so fantastic and talented and interesting. And um, But they show up for the first day of work. You know, they might be used to, like, working at, I don't know, Chick-fil-A or something. And I'm like, here's the deal. I know in your previous job, there were like a system and a way and everything had a system. And here, every time you show up, we might be doing something different. We're going to have some ongoing tasks that you're going to be trained in. But other than that, it might be a little bit of spray painting and a little bit of bubble wrap sealing and some packing and shipping and maybe some ideating and brainstorming and installing and screwdriver wielding. And uh, archiving, labeling, decorating could be just about anything. It sounds like a great internship. Oh, yeah, I know. And I, 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 I think it is. Well, that's what they think, too. They think it's fantastic. And actually, what we did last time was make rules. Um, it was their first time. So I'm like, what do you guys want the rules to be? And they had some questions that I hadn't thought of. They're like, what are we allowed to wear anything we want? What kind of clothes should we wear? And I'm like, oh, that is a good question for a first day of job. You know, job question. And Wait, um, I want to I want to back up a bit because I think okay. anybody anybody listening to this will be completely confused as to what the hell. I usually like about. to so, start in the middle and then work my way to both ends. Right, exactly. So let's start. Let's let's go back to the beginning again. So okay. So tell me about how this became what it is. Like, what is the purpose of it? What are you What are you actually doing? Great with this foundation because I think. I had imagined that it was something kind of different than it sounds like it was going to be. I thought it was more about, I, I'm not sure what, how much of it is about Amos's art and how much of it is about Amos's story and how much of it is about kids in need. Uh, I don't, I don't, more, or where is any of it all? So if you could just tell me like, what is, what is this foundation? What are you doing with it? Why are you trying to do it? That is a fantastic question. And I think that's the question that I, you know, was landed in my lap. Um, 
upon the death of my son Amos, who who died. Um, his story is he died when he was 19 years old. He had been making art really his whole life, but incredibly seriously for about five years, and um, he tra- he died tragically. A combination of he had a lot of uh, um, big T trauma going on in his life and mental illness situations going on and substance abuse. And so what ended up um, being his demise was that he uh, took a lot of Xanax and drank alcohol and probably smoked some pot and either passed out on a beach and drowned or walked into the water or some combination thereof or possibly fell down and hit his head and drowned. So we don't exactly know. Um, He left that mystery kind of unsolved, maybe never to be solved. But um, so he passed away when he was 19. And I can say that now with a more or less straight face because it was a few years ago and it has gotten easier for me to talk about. And um, it still does, of course, send me into, you know, periodic crying fits, but you never know when they're going to come up, come around maybe today, who knows? Anyway, when he died, he left this um, really previously uh, unknown, we didn't know exactly what he had, collection of artwork. So you can see behind me, there's about, um, we have about 100 pieces framed. There are about 500 altogether. There's about 200 figure drawings that are 18 by 24 that are really amazing, um, and 23 sketchbooks, uh, but a lot of completed finished pieces of art too. So as we started to, it's, we started to uncover it, it both people had some things he had a bunch of stuff when with him that we had not seen before there were paintings stashed all around in our house and our barn and his room and uh, various places a friends his old art teacher a lot of people sort of unearthed uh, pieces of his work and gave them back to us so when we took a look at all of that my first question was, what am I supposed to do with this? Should I save it? Should I get rid of it? I could not bring myself to throw it away. I didn't really want to sell it. Um, and I didn't really want to stick it in a closet. Um, so I did a little Googling and I came across this organization called the Institute for Artist Estates. <clears throat> and I'm telling this as in a storytelling form because that's how it happened <laughs> instead sure. of just going right to the answer. Okay, so Institute for Artists Estates. Well, that sounds interesting. Out of Berlin, and they published a book. So I bought this book that is the the handbook for artist estates, uh, or the artist estates handbook, something like that. We can probably put a link up when this actually runs because it's a an organization I really believe in, um, and it's a very kind of hoity-toity art world organization. There's a lot of famous artists. Um, it came out of there's a woman named Loretta Wurtenberger who was a lawyer dealing with artist estates and finding that a lot of different uh, people who end up with the artwork from an artist are in the same position, right? You you know, oftentimes it's a widow um, or a spouse, a widower. Sometimes it's a studio manager. Sometimes it's a child or a grandchild or a great grandchild or a ne- you know nephew or niece or somebody um, has is, is saddled with the task of figuring out what to do with somebody's artwork. And um, there's a variety of people. Some of the artists that they deal with are very well known. Others, not so much, but um, most of them artists that are important, um, that had enough going on that they had like an, an art practice, you know, and, the, and that people were aware that it was an important asset. So uh, this they published this book and it's partly legal, it's, it's financial, it's um, strategic. And then the back, so the first part of the book is very much like hands-on sort of technical guidance about what to do and the second part of the book is different people's stories about what they did and um it was fascinating and at the time i was like i had just you know i was still just trying to wrap my head around the fact that he was gone i was in extreme grief i was also reading all kinds of like grief book i you know my instinct in anything is to read (laughs) like i was like oh barnes and noble has a grief section who knew who knew i'd never been in there before and some of them were helpful, some of them weren't, but out of all of the books that I read, this artist handbook actually helps a lot because also, it, you know, it, uh, in a, on a human side, they'd even talked in the book about the emotional aspects of caring for another an artist's estate. You know, it's almost always some kind of situation where somebody's died. So uh, anyway, long story short, 
I, uh, then I Googled them up again and I, I learned, oh, they're having a conference in Los Angeles in 2019. Amos died in May of 2018. The conference was in September of 2019. So a little over a year afterwards as I was getting my act together. Ponied myself up the fee, coughed it up and went. It was four days in LA and it was unbelievably interesting and educating. And along the way, what I learned, what I took away from it is that one of the sentences in the book that stuck out for me, or maybe somebody said it in the conference, is that managing an artist estate is in itself a creative task. It can be whatever you want it to be. Unless the artist left very specific information about what they have want somebody to do with their artwork, which is extremely rare um, that somebody would do that. There's a couple artists that did, namely Keith Haring. We think about some of the big artist estates, Keith Haring and Andy Warhol, both were engaged with uh, charitable causes while they were alive, knew that they were going to die eventually, and had time and presence of mind and enough money and organizational skills and good archiving and all kinds of things that you need to really set up a, a an organized estate before they passed away, but most artists don't. And um, I actually looked at a lot of their systems and, and mission because as we started to think about it, there's some decisions that you have to make right away. Are you just going to preserve the art or are you going to try to do some kind of mission too? And some people have a museum, you know, depending on who the artist is, the Andy Warhol foundation estate has a museum it's interesting now the topic is very relevant because there's the huge Jean-Michel Basquiat exhibition that was just put on by his estate um, foundation and they had a lot of artwork that he left the family um, that had never been seen before so anyway bottom line is there are some ways that are best practices that you can do the first task is to preserve the oeuvre so save everything and archive it we got to visit this artist's um studio i should have the book in front of me Savalas. i can't forget enrique Savalas in la the most unbelievably organized individual i've ever encountered in the world beyond and you know the heck with anybody who says that artists are chaotic and not organized. This guy is so hyper organized. It was astonishing, but, um, and kind of bewildering. But again, from all of the different people that we heard speaking, I took away a little bits and pieces. Like he had this fantastic organizational system where he, you could read the name of the painting from the cor from he had little corner labels so that if you're looking to put together a show you can see 1988 this is that work here it is and that alone is like just a really hard thing to do when i started with rooms full of piles full we'd be like where's the you know portrait or whatever so everything from that kind of detail to um, the importance of having a strategy when you begin and and figuring out whether you want your foundation to be set up as purely dealing with the work of the artist or whether you want it to have a charitable mission so and you have to decide that when you're setting up the legal foundation so we decided eh, might as well have a mission <laughs> kind of off the top of my head and uh, right around that time we had his first show the college that he was going to go to Montserrat College of Art which I am just in love with this art school if anybody is interested in going to art school it's 400 students so it's super tiny it's, it's just like this very close-knit little community it's one of the first art schools in the United States that was started by completely by artists so it was started in the 1960s in a very communal kind of communy 60s idealistic way by nine artists who joined together to create a school and um, it still has that, you know, artist first mentality. And um, so they wanted right away, they were so, um, the students there were so affected by the fact that Amos died right in their backyard. He, he died in, Mont in uh, Beverly, Massachusetts, which is where the college is, that the students wanted to do something. The day after he died, the president of the college called and he was crying. He was in tears about Amos. He could hardly talk. And he said, what can we do? What can we do? What can the students do? And I said, I can't think of anything that, you know, they could do except tell them to stay alive. Tell them to stay alive. The main thing they need to do is stay alive. And the second thing they need to do is make art. And so four years later, our mission for our foundation is to inspire teens to stay alive and make art. Um, and we do that by using the work of Amos. We found that uh, kind of, well, as you know, art speaks 
from emotional core of the artist to the emotional core of the person who's experiencing it, whether it's music, novels, you know, theater, the idea is to strike your emotions. And what we found is that Amos's work is so emotional. It's emotional for everyone when they look at it in person, especially, but it's extremely emotional for teens. The minute these, um, <clears throat> we've had a couple shows now and you know, we had we had one where uh, 4,000 high school students got to come through the show in groups of 30. Every English class in the high school came through. And, you know, they were made to. They were told to go on a field trip all the way down the hall and go to the stupid art museum and look at some stupid paintings, you know. And um, probably the kids that were the most resistant to that were the kids who were the most affected. We have mm -hmm. video of them walking into the room and then stopping almost sometimes at the first piece and being captured and riveted and drawn in by the artwork. So we talked to the principal there and she said, you know, it takes 70 minutes for a teenager to trust another teenager and it takes 70 hours for a teenager to trust an adult. So Amos is telling them his story. He's talking directly to them and they understand what he's saying. We don't even understand it, but they get it. Um, I mean, I anyone can understand it, but teenagers, it like I've seen them burst into tears, have to clutch each other and sit down, giggle with laughter, holding on to each other, laughing so hard that they can hardly stand up, um, you know, and everything in between. Um, and usually we give them, when we try to do a group, we give them 20 minutes or half an hour to look at the gallery full of his work. That's the first thing we have them do. And we, it tells the story of his life. We have it arranged chronologically also so they can see his development as an artist where he started off with very sort of silly cartoony figures, a lot of heads. And um, he was interested in animation and character design. So he drew a lot of kooky wacky characters. And then, um, and then he started to intensely study the human body and do figure drawings. So there's a whole series in between of figure drawings, and you can see how technolo uh, technically excellent they are. From age 15, my husband, of course, is a little biased, but he's like, he's Michelangelo. He's Michelangelo. <laughs> you look at some of these figure drawings, and it's I've never seen anyone. I've certainly never been able to draw like that. I've never seen a student that I've ever had in college that is able to draw like that at that age um, and it's it's really miraculous and he again didn't necessarily have anyone teaching him he went to a class and the teacher said he picked up a piece of charcoal which he had never had before he intuitively knew to use the corner to make fine delicate lines and the side to make big black strokes he got right away to construct the dimension of the body using sh light and shadow I mean they're just they're astonishing so anyway went from silly cartoons highly technical figure drawing and then the experimentation continued and you can see how he began to mix in really heavy color psychedelic almost color action and then kind of layer all of those things together and as he began to really spin out into into pretty severe mental illness suicidality he was self-harming he was uh, really questioning his own gender. He painted himself at, a lot of times, both female and male. More often, he painted himself as a woman or drew himself. So he was just questioning, questioning, questioning everything. And you can see that in the words and images. There's really densely complex images. He also learned how to do animation. Took this wonderful short summer uh, course five weeks at Cal Arts in California. It was extremely competitive to get into this program. He got in and he blew everyone there away with his talent. And um, but there he learned this technique of um, zoetropes, which is an old early animation technique. It's basically like a flip book or like uh, 2D, you know, drawn animation. It's drawing a series of characters or whatever in motion, series of frames, frame by frame animation. But in zoetropes, they were drawn in one strip on one piece of paper. And then, um, t uh, you know, people today make GIFs out of them because you can just draw it on a, you know, strip of paper and then photograph each frame and make a an animated GIF. And he did some of those too. But he has tons and tons and tons, I mean, hundreds, if not thousands of those animated sequences layered on top of his underdrawings, his paintings. Anyway, that's all about the artwork. So... We take 
groups in. They spend about 20 minutes with Amos and his artwork. And um, and then we, what we realized right away is when looking at his work, it's this moment of uh, a teachable moment. It's an opening, like an emotional opening where people are like, what happened? How did that happen? How did someone who was so creative become so troubled? How did someone who was so smart become addicted? How could somebody, you know, so brilliant do something so stupid, basically, uh, you know, in this crazy way that he died? And um, so we felt like there was all this, an, an opportunity to talk to teenagers in a really direct way about all of those issues, mental health, um, substance abuse, substance abuse prevention, and also the way that all of those things are tied in to creativity. They're all things that happen in the human brain. And um, it was a little bit, this is where the foundation a little bit is affected by me and my interests, because those things have always fascinated me. Where is the line between creativity and mental illness? You know, is it if somebody becomes stops using substances, are they more creative? Or are they less creative? You know, do you have to suffer to be a great artist? So all of those questions, I think kids have them, too, especially creative kids. We are grown up with these myths. And I know you've talked about this before of like, oh, you're going to be an artist with a capital A. So you must, you know, suffer, live in a garret, starve, cut your ear off, die when you're 27 etc cetera, etc cetera. you know nothing but bad news but you know good luck have fun with that then when you die you'll get famous <laughs> and so um you know we really wanted to look at explode that but most myth. of which is ironically true of amos so it is ironically true of him but um and then it's like yeah so it's like is that true so you know again it's an opening and a a, an, a window for these um issues to be explored and um so our next thing was originally i was like there should be a poster you know in there i'm a graphic designer so i was like after they look at the show then there should be a poster <laughs> that ask all those questions and explains it like a research project and i think right around then is when COVID happened and as i lay you know tossing and turning in bed and also visiting a lot of museums and also being a person that's lifelong interested in art and the process of art and the process of learning. I'm a teacher. I'm a designer. I'm an advertising art director. In the world of advertising today, it's not about being like didactic and just telling people information in a print ad or in a t television spot. Our goal is always to involve people and to get them you know, enrolled in the um, the topic themselves, which is, you know, my philosophy as a teacher too, is to have it, uh, problem solving, problem driven learning is the most effective, like having someone do their own research, touch and engage and work with things in all the different learning modes, reading, writing, thinking, talking, making, connecting, playing games, all of those things are more effective than somebody yap, yap, yapping at you. And um, unfortunately, most information about mental health and drugs and alcohol is still given in high school. If you can remember, everyone, room 222, come down to the gym for the, um, <laughs> the, uh, announce, what, what are they called? The assembly with Mr. Officer McBoring, boing, boing, is going to tell us about Just drugs. say no. Just say <laughs> Just no. Just say no. You get a free bumper sticker that says dare. <laughs> and the students rightly are like bored to death so and don't you know don't believe it don't listen to it don't pay attention again adults can talk all they want but kid to kid so one of the crazy things when you look at Amos's work is you see the work that he produced before he began using the substances the work that he produced when he was using substances the work that he produced when he was the most tortured by depression and anxiety and then the work that he produced when he went through treatment and was on an antidepressant and not using and so you can see this total evolution from you know clean and sober and relatively stable at age 15 and then really messed up at age 17 18 and then sober at age 19 when everything seemed to kind of come together. So um, the story is told without anyone having to, to turn it into a lecture. It's like visually evident and emotionally raw. Um, so then in, 
after people see that, there's another component of the exhibition, which is where the creative graphic designer in me came out and the three-dimensional skills of my husband, who is a cabinet maker. So we have 15 different exhibits or installations that are something like you would see there's a museum in Philadelphia called the Please Touch Museum. And I studied a lot of their stuff. Or if you've ever been to like the Air and Space Museum in Florida or, you know, some of the really great interactive, the Cooper Hewitt has a lot of good stuff where everything in the room, my rules were everything in the room should be the viewer creates it not the it's not just a looking at thing it's a doing thing so something in the room there's something that you get to actively do with each exhibit you as a viewer and they go from there's a lot of art activities in there there's some writing things there's reflecting things and every exhibit is based on some fact or other from um either substance use prevention or mental health you know resiliency training or some skill building um thing an example is one of our favorite and most of them so Here's the thing is all of these things that I'm telling you, it's not like I woke up one day and was like, I know my son's going to die and I'm going to make a three-dimensional art museum. Ta-da, that's my life plan. It evolved so organically and it also evolved in a weirdly effortless way. It's like all I was trying to do was cope and deal and just get through the next day. And yet my subconscious brain or him acting through me, I don't know, you can get all woo-woo, but these ideas just kept popping up. And whenever I had one, I talked to my husband and he was, you know, as a grumpy old man, his job is to go, no, 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 I can't build a pyramid. What are you crazy? And then I'm like, how about an obelisk? And he's like, well, I can build an obelisk. And then like, how about if the obelisk is made out of pegboard? Yeah, I could do that. I'm like, can you find some kind of pegs to stick in the pegboard that will hold these little tags on so people can write on the tags and then they'll hang all the tags on the obelisk and the tags will have different colors and they have different meanings and then when it's done it'll be like a big shaggy shag monster that has everybody's responses to things and my husband's like mm, yeah I can do that so <laughs> <laughs> so there now it exists and uh, we started to show galleries and museums and educational institutions the idea. First, our first show was at this wonderful place near us called the Goggle Works Center for the Arts, which is a huge old factory, like classic sort of urban renewal, you know, old factory building that's been turned into artist studios and some big galleries and a theater and a, a glass blowing shop and a cabinet making shop. It's, it's a, a, excellent it's astoundingly wonderful place but they were we showed him his, his work and they were like immediately yes we would love to have a show of his work so that was one of the first things you know also as beginning the process i'm starting to show my his drawings and things to people and i i tried not to lead with a sob story like oh my son died and here's his piece of artwork what do you think because <laughs> that's like shading the you know the research so instead i'd be like what do you think of this drawing? People would go, oh my God, that's amazing. And then I'm like, what do you think if I tell you that the person that made it is 16? And they're like, oh my God, that's really amazing. Who's Which gallery is he with? And then I'm like, well, actually he's not with any gallery. So I could tell the story. So I was really questioning the validity of his artwork as gallery worthy artwork. But the more that I showed it to people, the more positive response we got. And, you know, we've had people that have burst into tears and wept. I mean, these are like museum directors that are, so moved that they can hardly speak so um we've just forged ahead one of my favorite exhibits is um the 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 research fact that i learned was that kids are more one a suicidality um exercise if someone is fe feeling suicidal is asking them about their life goals and dreams what would you like you know to turn that narrative around from a problem saturated narrative to a to a hopeful narrative. So asking like, tell me one thing that you hope to do, you know, what's, what's on your bucket list? What would you like to do? Or what would you like, what would be fun to do this summer, next year, by the time you're 50, you know, somewhere, you know, just give me some one thing that you're likely to do. And the research says that if you write down goals, then that's a healing thing. It's a a mental health turnaround thing and you're also more likely to achieve them if you write them down which people know that's why you know a lot of sort of uh life coaching thing people have you write down goals so we decided to make the bucket list 
and we have a bucket and a list and it's an infinitely long list. It's like an old grocery list with a pen and, um, and the bucket I found, this is the kind of thing where you're like, well, what's that? Oh, it's a cast of Amos's hand and he's going like this. And it's this little beautiful, delicate he had the he was obsessed with his own hands he drew them all the time he had really long i have kind of long fingers but he had really long ectomorph fingers so cast of his hand going like this the bucket handle fits right in there so there's a list there's a hand and the bucket and the bucket fills up with everyone's goals as they write them and so we now have probably 10,000 people's written down goals that went in there and some of them just reading that I need to find a way to like display that as a work too it's like now I've turned in the, the thing into another thing and then that's turned into another art thing but um reading these goals it's everything from like I want to kiss a girl to I want to graduate from high school to I want to be a professional baseball player to you know I want to go visit all of the major league baseball stadiums um you know and, and whatever I want to ride a horse it's it's amazing it's so inspiring to read these um so so bottom line we have an exhibit that's traveling around and we learned also in our experience in Indiana it was Richmond Indiana where it was next to the high school and the whole high school got to come through it the things, the response we got from the kids and the teachers, it transformed the high school. That experience transformed their spring of 2021. Um, it trained some of the high school counselors. They hired two more counselors because they saw the intense um, effects of both COVID and the opioid em epidemic that had come through their town. Um, you have, we have, it ends up, we have hard data when we ask people to do these writings. We have data about loss. We have data about their emotional issues. There's another project um, exhibit in there in the show called Chromatic Data, which asks someone to make a piece of artwork about a stressor and a strength and they're color coded. So when we put them on the wall, they essentially form a graph of which I, which things and issues are stressing people. Um, so every time you install it and do it in a different place, we get another read of what is happening with that population at that time. It's like a snapshot of mental health. So we have an exhibit we have, and then we, we've got so many requests for, can you bring this in a smaller form to our students in school? We can't, bus them over to the art gallery so can you bring it into the school so consequently we're looking at art galleries and organizations that are either adjacent to schools or integrated with a school system so that they have a ton of kids going through them um, at university and college art galleries of course that still population is still very affected by substance abuse and mental health and also we have workshops now that we can deliver and push into schools so we did in spring we did 400 sixth and seventh graders in two days we had two kids who identified as suicidal and showed us the, the self the wounds that they had made the day before and were notified with a school counselor and went immediately into inpatient treatment because we asked them the question of um you know how has mental illness affected you so um I did again I wouldn't have predicted this at the beginning and I don't think I could have clearly expressed what our mission was you know the day that he died but it seems to be that our mission is to sneak these complicated and triggering topics into an uh, a mode of expression that kids can relate to and understand and that especially speaks to creative kids originally we were like should we target artists should we sh target young artists as our population but you can't really untangle them from the environment that they're in and also amos himself um told one of his friends and i met her about a year into this process at a at a um speaker series thing a girl came up to me and said you know Amos one time I was sitting next to him in homeroom and he said do you want to play this game with me and it was essentially um exquisite corpse where one person draws a head and the next person draws the body and the next person which we used to do when he was a kid so he asked this girl would you like to play this and she said oh I can't do that I'm not an artist I'm not good like you and he said everyone's an artist so that theory which I also believe is true and I know that you do too is that you know how do we sort the artists from the non artist when they're in seventh grade we don't everyone is an artist so we deliver the information to all teens so that's why our 
mission statement is to inspire teens to stay alive and make art. We think whether whatever you do in life, using this creativity, using the the emotional, you know, the essence of creativity of all art forms, again, is to express emotion. So that is the opening. I guess art therapists know this or performance therapists or dance therapists. And I hate to call our thing, oh, we have a new way of art therapy because <laughs> it seems like it's different than that. But maybe it's not. I don't know. I'm not an art therapist. Um but what we have found is that it is a transformative experience for kids. And it's a super transformative experience for the people who care for kids as well, for teachers, for parents, for counselors, for mental health providers. All of those groups have been starting to come through and participate and lend their expertise. Our board, we have a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist, um, uh, a couple art educators, some professional artists, and you know, finance guy and a lawyer um, that are on our board, they're advising us. So we're combining all of those things and we really feel like there is a measurable differences in um, the way people are affected before and after they go through this exhibit and participate in these activities and that it's an effective, um, it's an effective method to do something. I don't know, are we, are we solving global warming? No, are we preventing, you know, healing people from the Ukrainian war? No, but I'm using what I have to do the things that I can do. And Amos is speaking to the people that he can speak to and telling his story. And um, it, it's, it's doing something out there in the world. So no, I, look, I think you, that you, was a lot. <laughs> and now I'd like to, let me just turn on the recording device. <laughs> I love no, you. No, that, I mean, that is, I'm just so proud of you. I think that what you've done is incredible. And, you know, you've taken, you've taken the situation that you were handed and you've made it into something really powerful and transformative. And you say you may not be changing global warming, but before you know, one of those teenagers whose lives might be changed or saved, they might be the one to do it. So I think what you're doing is ex extremely important. And I think it's just, it's so interesting how it's grown layer by layer as each thing. Cause I, I remember when we went, to, when we had that first memorial service, um, the fact that the whole room was filled with his art was in some ways like a, almost like a sort of a early version of that. Right. We were, yeah, everybody who was, was there, the we, were where all, we were like, Holy crap, we can't even fit it yeah. all in here. But also we were all, I think feeling obviously really intense emotions because of what had just happened. And there we were in this church surrounded by all of this art. And the cliche is like, he was still alive through his art, which was certainly true. I mean, I think, I mean, I mean, I met him when he was a little kid. Um, and when I think about him in that way, and then I think when I think about him now, I think about him in terms of his art, probably more than anything. And seeing all of that art, it was so staggering how much there was of it. I mean, I knew that he was going to art school. I knew that he was a creative kid, but then to see all that stuff and to see it um, and tied into the sort of bittersweet thing about what had become of him, what had happened to him. Um, yeah. And the fact that it seemed like he was on the road to recovery and then suddenly this tragic thing happened. So it was, the whole thing was so shocking and terrible um, but, but you've turned it into something so life affirming and valuable and that it's become, I think an important mission for you, that this may yeah. be what your life is about. And it makes me think also of Theo Van Gogh's wife, you know, right. who after, you know, Theo died and Vincent died, she, she made him into Vincent Van Gogh. I mean, she, right. she, she built, and, and you're doing more than that, I think, because you're not just trying to establish his viability as an artist, which, um, you know, I think is part of what he's about, but I think it's more this deeper yeah. message and it isn't necessarily even his message. I think he represents it, but I think you've turned it into your own message, which yeah. comes from your own, uh, your own transformation of your own life. You're using it all this together to, to really affect the world, not to just have some, pretty pictures or even great art, but it's, it's much more than that. So I'm really proud of you for that. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Well, it's also like almost in every aspect, 
you know, when I started, one of the things they said in the um, Artist Institute is, what was the artist's intention? You know, what were they? And one of the things, Amos was so excited about showing his work. It was really like he was that pure artist. Like he didn't give a shit about making money. He didn't give a shit about being famous. He just wanted people to see it. And and he was also very conflicted about that. You know, he was so critical of himself that it was like, oh, this isn't good enough. This isn't good enough. This isn't good enough. But um, so the one thing I knew about him is he wanted to have a show. That was one of the reasons he picked Montserrat is because they have this whole little main street in Beverly and every senior gets a real gap gallery as their show so he thought that was like oh to be a senior you know to have a whole gallery and so I was like I know he wants to show that's what I know so I guess and people like like to see it it's fun to look at it's not doing anybody any good when it's you know stuck on a shelf so let's just get it out there and then that just kind of like I said I feel like at every step there's been the obvious next step that I didn't really you know plan it just sort of was right that you know then a person comes along and asks for this and then a person asks for this and then it just sort of so one of the cool things is a couple of weeks from now it's going up in a gallery um not too far from here and they are it's an all it's an artist uh it is called an artist institute and it's so it's dance performance music theater you know little kids preschool and visual art and so they were like can we put up the when we have the show in the gallery we, we want to do have the teens do their own composition, musical and dance performance. And we want them to react or tell the story of how li- how their lives have been saved by art. They're always saying, this song saved my life or dance saved my life or music saved my life. So they're going to tell a story and in performance of how art has saved their life. And it's going to be based around Amos's work. And they're going to have the performance while the show is there. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> sounds good. So, you know, it's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that dimension. That'll be interesting, and uh, yeah, who yeah, knows? I think, the, I think the fact the fact that you're encouraging engagement. I mean, I think back to when we did um, that episode of Draw with me, where we showed some of his work, we told his story, and people drew. I mean, that is of all the episodes we've done, it's like one of the most um, watched episodes. And I think people continue to make art from it. So just looking at his art, it makes you want to make art. Not right. just passive. You want to engage, and his story deepens that engagement. So I think it's just the, the simplicity, also of your message. I mean, stay alive and make art. It's like, well, I mean, how hard is that? So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and our new—we're having a benefit. This is my the commercial program part of the program. We're having a benefit. If anybody's interested in New York, uh, uh, on New York on November fourth, which is the day before his birthday. And it's at the LGBTQ Center on 13th Street. And we were trying to come up with a theme. I have these fancy, fancy people on the committee. And, you know, we're trying to think of what is the theme. Last year we had one and it was called Electric Pink Clouds. And that just sort of came out of his work. So we're like, let's look at some of Amos's posts. And we, I had all of these different words. He wrote so much. So they were all words from his posts. And the one that people seemed to like was um, Life Too Hard, Send Help. <laughs> There was a, there was a uh, Instagram post with, and it was a picture of a dead moth and just his caption was life too hard, send help, which is very dry and Amos and funny. So that's our theme. This is a portion of our decor. I have about 800 million thousand feet of caution tape that says life too hard, send help. It's like, this is like police warning tape, (laughs) but it says life too hard, send help. Yeah, that's hilarious. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to send help, you know? Well, it's also, I think just from, from you, from your personal point of view, I mean, you've spent your whole career making things, solving problems, putting out, communicating, getting messages out there. Then you spent the next part of your life teaching young people, um, as a, as a college professor. And this is sort of like bringing all these strengths that you have together, right. And, and doing something that you really think, you know, matters a huge amount. And, and, that you've lived. I think it's, I think it's an incredible gift that you've gotten, you know, to really make a difference in the world. It's, it's yeah. super cool. Crazy weird. Not, not, not the path I picked. Would have picked. I should have been a costume designer for Hollywood. Dang it. <laughs> Next time. Next yeah. time around. I do have an opportunity to make a dog costume for Barktober that's coming up. 
There you go. Very exciting. So let me ask you, so this, so you've been doing this for a couple of years now. Yeah. Um, is this like, do you imagine this going on for years? Is it, is it, is it going to become like a thing that goes beyond you? Yeah, that's a great question. We just did a strategic plan. That's one of the other things in the book is have a strategy. Think, stop, think, right. don't sell any art. Think about it for a while. And what is your strategy? What are you trying to accomplish? So we um, found this amazing guy who was actually part, I met at the conference who is a, a longtime um, uh, artist foundation guy. He's, he ran the David Hockney Foundation for a while amazing man, Richard Benefeld, and he helped us put together a strategic plan. So, and one of the components is, you know, I'm 60 right now. My husband is 65. Uh, we figure we got about 10 to 25 good, strong years in us. So, um, and this also kind of evolved over COVID. So we're selling the 13 acre farm because too much shoveling and mowing and painting and shellacking. Um, the gourd shellacking alone is <laughs> In the fall, so many gourds to shellac. Sorry, that was a reference to a Thank New York, God. Uh, Mick Sweeney's article. Anyway, um, and we happen to also own, curiously, a factory, a 45,000 square foot factory. So the third floor of the factory is the main street of our little town. It's going to be our foundation offices, an art gallery for young and emerging authors artists in the front and a workshop space in the back for after teen or after school teen art classes or programs and uh, so we have a, the space to work with and then we're going to fix up the upstairs floor above that and live there so that we can just lock our door and go and um, we're going to put we, we haven't decided yet whether we're going to try to just like do this for our lifetime and then liquidate everything. I think a little bit of it depends on how we do in the next few years and how our board grows and evolves. You know, lots of um, some artist foundations is one of the steps you have to build in is what do you want to do? Do you want the art to all get sold in the end? Do you want it to all go together into a museum? Do you want it to be, you know, handed off to the next generation? Um, we, Amos was an only child, so we don't have any other kids to leave things true, but we have these curiously aligned, crazily aligned nieces and nephews, one of whom is the oh. secretary of our board right now who just got a master's in arts administration and works at, he's the development director of the Buffalo Philharmonic right now. Um, so go. we don't know if someone will carry on, if there'll be enough money to hire an executive director someday and just keep it going. Or if not, if that doesn't work, then you know, eventually it will just, I guess, the collection of artwork hopefully will go somewhere. Um, we don't know right now. We don't have any plans of selling it uh, or just continuing to do the things that we can do while we can do them. And I guess we'll kind of figure that out as it develops. But we think the artwork and the message, you know, will be able to live on and, and it be self-sustaining. Um, the other thing that's kind of amazing is that we started out making a few little things like um, – Got this little tattoo here of the flying guy. That's Amos's flying guy. Whoops, can't really show him. Anyway, he's uh, he's on our logo, Stay Alive Make Art logo. He's like shooting out of here. <laughs> so, um, so and people are like, can I have him as a tattoo? P I, about five people I know of different ages have gotten Amos artwork tattoos all over them now. And so we have prints we have hats we have t-shirts we have scarves these beautiful scarves we have pencil cases and again that just sort of happened because people wanted something we didn't want to sell the original artwork so we're selling stuff look da danny just picks up his sketchbook school mug oh yeah merchandise <laughs> so so people um enjoy that and it reminds them you know of him too and it, it's wonderful artwork well next you have to have like the van the van gogh experience and now they're doing the free i, I don't experience. think we're you gonna have, to, have the van we might i mean by to, then i feel like it's just in a couple of years we're gonna be able to just plug it into your brain you know feed and be able to like virtually experience that in into your, your pod. <laughs> right i don't know exactly. we'll see one of the things we love about the, our experience right now is that people kept trying, oh, you should have some digital things. Kids kids love digital things. It should have like, you know, the thing. And first of all, my husband doesn't know how to build digital things. I can imagine them, but I'm not a good like coder. And also we found that the experience when a group goes into the room, 
they forget about their devices because they're so busy talking to each other and playing with right. things. And that might be a good thing for teenagers right now. It might kind of be good for them to put down their phones and quit capturing the QR codes to everything. So for now, the show itself is very analog. Um, I would like to be able to scale it into some kind of digital, you know, like some, some film, I don't know, something that is so that you don't ha if you can't go to the show, if you're some kid in East, you know, Jibip, you're, you're able to get a little of the inspiration, but we'll, we'll be working on that. Excellent. You well. know all about that. No, I was going to say when you were talking about it before, I was like, I'm sure that they're going to want to do some online experience because obviously if you rather than busing kids around to yeah. museums, but I think having kids go to a museum, kids who might not normally go to a museum and having an emotional experience there could be something that really affects them for the long term as opposed to just, yeah. you know, one more Instagram account to flip through. So right. I think it's a good, I think it's, I mean, but we're, we're ancient. So yeah. What do we know? Actually, we know a lot. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> but, but nobody listens to us. <laughs> Those kids. You no, know, my interns are like, I think I, when I was like, what do you guys want? Do you think we should have a rule about phone use? And they're like, I don't think we should use phones while we're here at work. And I was like, hmm. And they're like, unless we need to, like if we if we want to take a picture unless of something. Unless we want to. Right. Unless I need to check, you know, TikTok, um, something important. Yeah. <laughs> somebody broke up with somebody. That's an emergency. <laughs> oh, my God. A celebrity. <laughs> totally. Exactly. <laughs> Well, cool. Well, thanks for uh, chatting with me about all this. What, what do you want people to do? As a uh, people should go to amoslemon.org, A-M-O-S-L-E-M-O-N.org. Amos, some people say, Amos is an old Bible name. And when he was born, he just named himself. We reached into the ancient, you know, ancestor bucket and pulled out the name Amos and then Dane's dad walked in on my, I'm Lemon, Dane is Burkhart. Um, and uh, so he was Amos Lemon Burkhart. But uh, Dane's dad walked in and said, oh, I had an Uncle Amos Burkhart. I always liked him. So we're like, oh, okay. Never heard about Am Uncle Amos. But, huh? So, you know, That's and what... Amos himself, he had a love hate. He, he liked Amos because it was unusual, but he ended up wanting to be known as Lemon. So he called himself Lemon. So Amos Lemon. <laughs> Now you have lemonade. Yes, yes, we literally made lemonade. Amos, on Gosh. one of his paintings, he has. So this is the kind of thing that kids crack up. He has a little line on there that says, "Life gave me lemons, then she peed on my face." <laughs> and it's like, would you mind oh. if I got that tattooed on my neck? Yes. <laughs> you can. I mean, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> I know someone who might want to stop you. Yeah. Yes, the other oh. thing he did was. Um, he had this silly picture of a kid with an upside down pot on his head with some like green paint coming out. And it was in his sort of video game thing. He had a lot of guys that looked like army guys. And so I think the idea of like wearing a pot on your head as like an army helmet is where that came from. But anyway, it's a picture of somebody with an upside down pot on their head. And I never thought of this, but see, this is what I'm talking about. Teens, 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 bunch of, Ne'er do well teens came in and what did they see? What did they call it? Up oh, they're like, pot, it's a pothead. Pot head. Uh, and I was like, oh yeah, maybe. I thought they didn't call it pot anymore. I, anyway. I don't know. Yeah, weed. Sorry. But anyway, they thought it was hilarious. I was like, maybe he did build that in. I'm not sure. I think he was only like fourteen when he did that, so I don't I don't think he was doing that intentionally, but whatever. They thought it was hilarious. So kids. Good kids. Down. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to stop recording now because I, uh, yes, running out, running out of computer and time. That was a powerful conversation. I hope uh, you got some inspiration from it. And Lemon is, um, she's just a fascinating person, full of ideas. Her mind is going a million miles an hour, as you can tell. She's hilarious, and I love to chat with her. And I believe the work that she's doing with her foundation is really important and shows the incredible power that art making can have to save lives. I've experienced it firsthand. I will put more information about the foundation and um, 
ways in which you can get in touch with Anne and you can support the foundation if you'd like. I'm down in the notes for this episode. Thanks very much for joining me and Anne. And I will see you again next week on Art for All when we have another interesting conversation about being a creative person. This is Danny Gregory. Thanks very much. 